Um, yeah, yeah, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, and thanks for the introduction, Adriana. Um, so to all the organizers, thanks for having me here. It's a great pleasure to be speaking here. Um, so I want to talk about uh, um, so a new uh, solution concept for mean curvature flow, um, which uh, kind of arose out of a few other projects. You, I'll show you how this came up naturally. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is joint work with uh, Sebastian Hensel. Um, so everything I'm saying here, you can find uh, that that preprint. Um, so so let me first say uh, what mean curvature flow is. So th those are two animated videos there. So there's a very sm slowly shrinking sphere. Um, and, uh, and the other one is uh, in 2D, things are very trivial because uh, two-phase mean curvature flow in 2D, uh, we know, uh, becomes uh, convex in finite time. No matter how, com how, how complicated you uh, set up your initial conditions, it's going to become convex at some point and then shrink to a point. And gonna, it's going to become rounder and rounder. Um, and uh, so we know this very well. So, um, so the, the equation that we, that we study is, uh, um, as the previous speakers also mentioned, uh, also there it was mean curvature flow. So the velocity is proportional. So the normal velocity of the surface is proportional to the mean curvature. And that is, uh, um, that is a nice geometric evolution equation and it's a steepest descent. So it's a gradient flow of an energy function in, uh, in some, uh, uh, so, so, so in this uh, energy landscape of that functional, so I should define two things to specify what the gradient flow is. One is um, the energy. Um, so those are just the values that I assign to, uh, to different uh, states. And, and then the metric which tells me uh, how the solution space looks like. Um, and, uh, and this is here just the L2 metric. So there are these two weights, the surface tension and the mobility uh, which uh, have some physical relevance. So I keep them here on this slide, but uh, because this whole talk today, I'm just gonna talk about two uh, phases. I'm um, just like in this picture on the bottom right, um, but in any dimension. Um, because of that, uh, I can uh, just scale out these two numbers. Uh, otherwise they really play, play some role and independent roles. Um, but here you can think of them being equal to one. So it's easy to see that, uh, that you have this gradient flow structure. You can read it off from this uh, computation that also Harald did uh, this morning. Um, so uh, you, uh, uh, you compute this, uh, the uh, change of the surface area and no matter, I mean, no matter what evolution you have, it's always um, the mean curvature times the velocity that you get out of there. And uh, you plug in the equation and you see this is, uh, First of all, it's uh, less equal to zero, right? So because it's minus the square. Um, but furthermore, it's also um, the, I mean, so the velocity is pointing in the steepest, in the direction of steepest descent. Um, and we want to use this um, for, our, for our weak solution concept. But let me first tell you what kind of, I mean, it's some of the um, solution concepts that are, that are around. So we, we want to study weak solutions. You didn't see it on the two examples. Uh, but but you run into singularities. You know this very well. Uh, you can you usually you would run into singularities in finite time, and you still want to uh, kind of continue the, the evolution. And uh, and for this uh, we want to define weak weak solutions. And the oldest one, and actually the oldest math paper on mean curvature flow, was Bracky's PhD thesis, um, where um, actually I don't know if it's seventy seven or seventy eight. Uh, um, so I mean, here's the thesis and it's published. So, so okay, so I'm not sure about the number. But anyways, he, um, he also looks at something like uh, this energy, but he localizes with the test function. So you can think of this uh, phi as either a constant or a bump function maybe. Um, and then uh, you can monitor this uh, localized energy. And, uh, and that's, that's what he gets. So he has to generalize this a bit, uh, kind of, uh, but, but basic, basically that's the inequality. And it measures uh, how fast uh, the energy goes down. And um, I mean, be, on the slide before I said V squared, here he says H squared. Okay, there's probably no big difference as long as uh, kind of, uh, I actually had a solution of this equation, right? Um, and then of course, because phi also depends on time or may depend on time, you, the time derivative can also fall onto phi. And then there's this, this term in the middle, which is kind of the transport term. And you may imagine that maybe, for example, the sphere that was shrinking, um, 
at some point enters the support of phi and then leaves the support again. And that is that is exactly what this term here, uh, what this term describes, the term in the middle. And it's just a, just by chain rule, basically, if you plug in the parameterization, if you want, um, it's just a transport term. Okay. Um, then there's another solution concept due to Lockhouse and Stutznecker, who uh, who say that okay, you have this equation between v and h, and uh, both of these uh, quantities you can um, uh, you can define through some uh, integration by parts, and we'll see this also later again. So they will show up again these definitions. Um, then, in this particular case of just two phases, there's another. Um, there's another structure that you can use, which is the comparison principle. So this geometric comparison principle uh, for mean curvature flow that nested sets will remain nested. Um, and uh, so there will also not be self intersections. Uh, um, so embeddedness will stay preserved. And, and what, what they do is then instead of just looking at one mean curvature flow, they look at the whole foliation of your space. And let each of these uh, um, surfaces uh, move by mean curvature flow, and it will remain a, a foliation by the comparison principle, and uh, and that gives you much more information. And okay, technically you write this then down, of course, as a, as a function, and these uh, um, elements in the foliation are, are the level sets of that uh, of that function. And um, the the technology that you want to use is then the technology of viscosity solutions. Um, but of course, you can also view this more ge uh, geometrically, like uh, the Georgi with barriers. Um, so our new solution concept. So the, the this is a wonderful solution concept. This viscosity solution. The only drawback is that it's it's, it's really limited to two phases. Um, so if you are interested in uh, the network flow or the more more generally just multi-phase mean curvature flow, um, that is uh, completely out of reach for that method. That's why we are after other weak formulations. Otherwise, that one would have been uh, our dream formulation somehow. Um, so the new solution concept that I want to show you today is, uh, is the following. Um, so, so I just compute how the, uh, how the change of total energy, um, uh, I just compute the total change of energy. And I want this inequality where on the right hand side, I don't have just h squared, like in Bracky's formulation, but I have half a bit of h squared and half a bit of v squared. And then this v and h, I have to define them. Okay, so that's that's the idea. But why is that, uh, why is that uh, useful? And that the, the, uh, the idea comes from uh, general gradient flows. Um, so, um, so if you integrate up this inequality that, we, that I had, this pointwise inequality, you integrate it up in time, you get this one inequality. This is an inequality between two numbers on the right, left-hand side. So fixed t, fixed uh, time horizon t. Um, you have uh, one number on the left and one number on the, on the right. Uh, but if you have something that is nice and smooth, so some surfaces that evolve smoothly, but you don't know they satisfy the equation, um, from this inequality, you can prove that it's actually a mean curvature flow. And that's very simple because you can just, uh, if everything is nice and smooth, you can compute the change of, uh, uh, the rate of change of area, um, and then you just recognize the square on the left, and and you see also that's why uh, that's why uh, um, the inequality is sufficient. So this uh, this idea, of course, uh, um, is just kind of a formal argument. So I'm assuming that the thing is smooth and so on, but uh, uh, it's it's a good hint at the fact that this might be a good uh, a good definition. Of course, now we want to. Uh, generalized this framework a bit, and this is uh, very similar to what uh, Bracky did. And and here's the definition. So I'm going to walk through this slowly. Um, and uh, okay, so so we want to use use measure theory because there you have much nicer compactness properties. Um, and uh, so let me explain what the quantities are. Okay, so you have a measure and uh, a characteristic characteristic function which describes kind of your phase. Uh, so chi is one inside uh, the open set set that you're thinking of that whose boundary should evolve by mean curvature flow. And mu, this measure um, has uh, you can disintegrate it, and it has these three uh, uh, these it comes with these uh, three bits. Uh, and okay, so it's uh, absolutely continuous in time. Um, then it has uh, some probability measure on uh, on the directions, 
Um, so this you should think of a probability measure on possible normals to your surface. And this uh, omega t, you should think of uh, the, the, volume, uh, the volume form that you want to integrate over the, over the surface. So um, maybe let's go, go down here to the last uh, line. So what you should have in mind always, this uh, chi is the characteristic function of your nice uh, set that you want to evolve by mean curvature flow, the boundary of which you want to evolve by mean curvature flow. And this, uh, this omega t is just the, um, the kind of surface measure restricted to, to, to your surface. And, uh, and this, uh, this probability measure on the directions um, you, you should then think of just a, the a Dirac delta at, at the normal of your, of your interface. And uh, okay, so we have this pair of uh, measure that lives on the space, uh, um, on, on this product space of uh, points in space, directions, and time. Uh, and you have this uh, characteristic function that lives on space and time. Okay, so first of all, we have these two items that there exists a normal velocity and a mean curvature vector. Let's skip these two for the moment and let's go to the item number three. That is exactly the inequality that I showed you before. This, uh, if, if, uh, if you should think of uh, this omega t as your, your, um, your area element uh, that you would integrate, if I apply this to all of Rn, uh, all of Rd, um, then I get just the total, uh, the total area of my of my interface at, at that given time capital T. So this is exactly uh, uh, exactly what we saw on the slide before. Um, and here I'm integrating just these two the squares of these two um, of these two functions um, over my surface. This is what this measure here does, and that should be uh, bounded by my initial area. Okay. Um, okay. And then lastly, you have this compatibility. That somehow the, the this characteristic function, so this open set, should have some connection to uh, to the measure that you that you're talking about. Um, so, so this is uh, kind of the uh, the first moment of that measure in in the direction space should be exactly um, your normal direction. So, in average, you you will get the correct uh, the correct normal direction, but uh, but you might have a superposition of several Dirac deltas there or um, or other other things. Um, okay, and, and now let's let's go come to these point items one and two. So this normal velocity. So that uh, is a function, just an, uh, a true uh, function with respect to that uh, that area measure, and uh, and it it should be such that um, you you get a, um, a transport equation, transport type equation for this characteristic function. So if you if you go down here to that to that um, vanilla case, then it's really just exactly the transport equation um, for that for that characteristic function. Um, and then uh, the mean curvature vector is just uh, um, so you should think of the mean curvature vector times that measure again, and and that will be uh, um, the divergence of some uh, of of some stress tensor. And and here you you can write it down like this, but I'll write it down in more. Um, in a more explicit way on the next slide. And then you see that it's just uh, the usual thing that you would see uh, for the mean curvature, that is integration by parts. Okay, so this is the, the weak formulation. And I want to talk about this today. So I want to show you in particular existence of solutions to this and uh, the uni uniqueness of them uh, as long as at least uh, um, a strong solution exists to mean curvature flow. So you can have non-uniqueness in mean curvature flow. Um, and uh, and the solution concept uh, would also of course allow the for this non uniqueness uh, because after singularities you um, there might be several solutions and all of them would be should be such a solution um, but uh, the point is uh, that until then you would have uniqueness of classical solutions and for that time you also have uniqueness for the solution concept and uh, let me just stress this uh, once more so you have uniqueness until then, although you just have this one inequality. Um, there's, not, uh, there's not so much that you know, right? I mean, you, you have the definition of these quantities, you have this compatibility, but the actual uh, information that you have on how uh, V and H, uh, these two, these two uh, quantities are linked, um, are just somehow through this energy dissipation uh, rate. 
Okay, so let me let me make some of the things uh, more uh, more concrete. So this uh, this transport equation. I mean, you you can uh, uh, just you test with the test function, and then uh, you you integrate by parts. This is how you should define this. Um, and the the important thing is that I also want to use this to encode the initial conditions. So the initial conditions are encoded in two places. So the initial condition condition for the for the for the characteristic function I can encode here, while the initial conditions for the measure I can encode in the initial energy. And and that's it. That's the only way how you um, encode the initial conditions. Um, okay. And and this uh, this divergence of the stress tensor for the mean curvature. So you can you can just spell it out, and you see this is the tangential divergence of your of this uh, of this test vector field B, and uh, and and that is exactly after integration by parts gives you exactly the mean curvature if everything everything was nice and smooth. This is just the standard um, the standard uh, um, uh, the mean curvature operator, right? So I mean I didn't mention the word very fault I think, but I mean of course these are very faults, right? These are evolving very faults. So the mu t is a is a very fault, um, and uh, but it's just um, right. I mean it's just a measure on this on this product space, and this this would be exactly the first variation of the very fault. Okay, so um, so there's a, a similar approach uh, that uh, I started uh, with uh, Felix Otto, and that uh, we generalized to uh, the, the kind of uh, multi-phase and uh, arbitrary mobilities and uh, and surface tensions case with my student Yuna Lemi, um, just recently, and and there we actually we uh, we were looking at at a numerical scheme, the thresholding scheme, and uh, but but the big difference to the work that I'm presenting today is that there we have some uh, some condition, uh, there, so those are just conditional results, and what I want to show you today this there's no condition in here. Um, okay, and. Uh, so, so um, one other thing that I should remark is that if you know, um, I mean, if you know that everything is smooth, then uh, kind of uh, then things would uh, would also play out like I say here. But even if you have nice singularities, and the nicest singularities are mean convex singularities, that means that the just the mean curvature is strictly positive that stays preserved for mean curvature flow, as um, as Harald explained. Even in his more complicated uh, setting, this is preserved, and for mean curvature flow, we know very well it's preserved. Um, and uh, if 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 this is true, then we can run into singularities, but they are much nicer. And and then you can show that that this uh, this energy measure um, is just exactly um, kind of the, the 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 perimeter of your of the set that you were enclosing. And so that was uh, I did this together with Guido de Filippis for for the Unwin Taylor Wong scheme and with Jakob Fuchs uh, just recently master's thesis. Um, project so, um, in his master's thesis project, we did this uh, for the thresholding scheme that I mentioned before. And uh, and I should also mention a, a very recent improvement of these Bracky solutions. So these Bracky solutions, they are fatally non-unique. So you have to be very uh, very careful when talking about these because even before the onset of singularities, they they can become non-unique. You can just uh, uh, at any given time I mean, take this nice mean curvature flow and cut it off at some point, just continue with the empty set, and that is a solution. Um, that is not the case here because we have this velocity term there. And uh, and there's there's some approach uh, the, that uh, kind of has a final, does a final analysis by Stuart and Turangawa. Okay, so how we want to construct the solution. So I don't, don't want to use any construction, but I want to use the most uh, canonical somehow. Which is the Allen Kahn equation, which is also a physical model in its own right, and it's always interesting to get, kind of get uh, connections between different physical models. Um, so this is just a reaction diffusion equation, and and the potential that you see on the right hand side here, so that gives us the diffusion. This is a very fast diffusion, um, so so that one uh, that one should be of double well type, uh, so that you have two stable states. Um, so. Um, the, the, this is the L2 gradient flow um, of the um, Ginzburg Landau energy or Kahn Hilliard energy. And uh, it's, it has a, the nice, I mean, at the energy, you can see very nicely what's happening. There's a competition between uh, the diffusion and the reaction. So the first term, the, the Dirichlet energy there, um, which gives us the diffusion and the equation, 
wants everything to be nice and smooth, wants the gradient to be uh, kind of in L2 and maybe small in L2 even. Um, so uh, it wants to make, make things nice and smooth, while the second term um, with this uh, double world potential, of course, wants, uh, wants, to, uh, wants to have just a value zero or one. So um, because of this competition, you will see uh, there's going to be a certain length scale, and that's exactly the scale epsilon that will show up at which transitions will happen between these values zero and one. And, uh, and, uh, and otherwise, you will be just exactly in the worlds of this, of this potential. Um, okay, so you can check uh, just by a direct computation that this is indeed uh, the gradient flow of this energy, uh, L2 gradient flow of this energy. And, uh, and it's also not too, too hard to check uh, if you assume that your, your function uh, has some, is, is some profile modeled along uh, some surface. Um, and I'll motivate this. Uh, so, so when I show you the video, the simulation, you will see why, where, this where this is motivated from. Um, if you make this ansatz, and then you just uh, plug this into equation, the equation and collect the terms with the same um, order in epsilon, so just a formal asymptotic expansion, you will see that the profile should solve the 1D version of this, uh, of this, of the static case of this. Should, should be an optimal profile um, connecting the two, the two uh, stable points zero and one. And the surface around which you model this, this should be a mean curvature flow. So that there's the connection to mean curvature flow already. And so here's the, the, the um, simulation I want to show you. So I just use uh, um, periodic boundary conditions here. So that's why it looks a little bit funny. Um, and I started with random initial conditions, just random numbers between zero and one. And you see, uh, let me show this again. Um, you see this, oops, uh, you see this very fast, uh, you see this very fast uh, first phase where where kind of these uh, out of the randomness you you get kind of uh, these uh, this nice pattern of uh, blue regions and yellow regions and and then you see this coarsening uh, and you see kind of how things uh, how things uh, shrink um, and uh, and you see basically you have exactly these I mean here curves with uh, with a nice transition um, around them. So that's where people why people came up with this uh, with this answer. Okay, so let me show you my my results. Um, so the first uh, result. So this is, I mean, as I said, all of this is um, joint work with uh, Sebastian Hensel, who's a very strong uh, postdoc uh, here in Bonn. Um, so what uh, the first result is using this Allen Kahn equation to construct solutions. So given some condition on the initial conditions, uh, so they have to be, they should look nice uh, so that we avoid this first transition layer, this first first time from the randomness, for example, so that kind of they look like nice profiles. But that is a valid assumption somehow that we usually make because this first, this first short time you have to analyze with different methods. But suppose you're already in this regime where kind of uh, the initial conditions look nice uh, and no other conditions, you're just assuming something on the initial conditions, then you know that um, you have compactness. So the, the phase fields, the u epsilons converge to some function that is uh, uh, on, has only value zero and one, a characteristic function. And the measures um, that I'll def define in a moment they, that come from the energy, they converge as rather measures. So I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you later what these measures are. So I'm not. Uh, I'm not showing you this, but I'm telling you kind of. They, they somehow have something to do with this energy density, but they must also have a direction, right? So this is a little bit vague here, but um, it's better for me, I think, to to state it now, and then we can discuss it later in the proof. Um, and the, the main point of this theorem is item two, is that this limit is a De Georgi type very false solution, exactly what, what we defined before. So it's exactly a solution in this, in this, uh, in this kind of setting. Okay, um, so, uh, and, and the initial conditions are exactly the initial conditions you would uh, expect. Uh, and under some conditions, you actually need, just need second moments, but let's say, for example, if the, um, if the um, support is compact uh, initially, then you can uh, you can um, take any pair um, of points for which you can get the energy dissipation estimate, and you also get uh, some uh, integrality 
So, so these are actually nice, uh, nice surfaces just with multiplicity. Okay. Um, so the item three and four are maybe, I mean, so four is, uh, is already known because we have uh, mean curvature bounds. Um, item three is uh, kind of just a little bit post-processing um, and one is just compactness. So the, really the big point here is uh, item number two. So that uh, these, this limit as a De Georgi uh, solution. Um, and then the second result in the same paper is uh, that um, that we have weak strong uniqueness. So um, suppose you have a smooth solution, uh, just a regular solution um, to mean curvature flow, like uh, like Alessandra explained also in her talk. Um, kind of these network flows, they they fall into this into this setting. Um, and uh, and suppose uh, you have uh, you have a De Georgi variable solution, then uh, they have to agree in the sense how they can agree, right? That uh, kind of the characteristic functions are almost everywhere the same, right? And, um, and the measure has to be exactly the, the host of measure on that boundary. Um, um, so, so this is initially, and then this is gonna be true later on. And you also have uh, the, the identity for the, for the uh, measures actually. I'm just not stating it here. So uh, then uh, kind of the direction is a delta and, uh, and the energy measures are also the same. But uh, the, the two solutions agree. So there's no non-uniqueness that we previously had for Bracky solutions. Um, of course, if you put more assumptions on your solutions, um, except for just uh, in addition to the to the definition, then you can get uh, you can get also for Bracky solutions, for example, the Stuvert Tonagava solutions, um, together with uh, um, Julian Fischer and uh, Teresa Simon. Um, um, so. so, so um, um, Sebastian and I, we with them together, we uh, we did this uh, uh, kind of uh, this first project where we uh, first looked at BV solutions. But they this proof also works for these Stuva Tunigava solutions that are um, that just came out now. Um, but uh, here the point is that you don't need to know so much, and and we somehow wanted to see what are the minimal assumptions, and and somehow you don't need a lot of structure on your on your solution. You just need the one right uh, inequality. Um, yeah, and you don't also need, you don't need any uh, um, regularities or rectifiability or integrality. Um, okay, so th that's what I want to talk about. And maybe let me tell you a little bit about uh, about the proof in a moment. Um, but but first, uh, maybe I can t t talk a little bit about uh, related work. Um, so. Of course, in the static in the static case, this is uh, extremely well uh, understood. Um, so Monica and Motula and uh, Sternberg, um, they they uh, proved the, the gamma convergence of these energies. So the energies converge, then the gradient flow should also converge. Um, that is that is somehow why this should be true. Um, and uh, so with different methods, people have um, have obtained several results uh, for this question. Allen Kahn equation uh, to mean curvature flow. Um, so let me maybe point out the one that is uh, that is was our inspiration and that's uh, very important for us is this paper by Tom Ilman and um, who proves that um, any limit of the Allen Kahn equation under some conditions on the initial conditions um, is a Bracky flow. So this is uh, this is also an energy dissipation inequality, but where you measure everything in terms of the mean curvature. So unfortunately in the, in the vectorial setting, so you could write down the Allen Kahn, uh, system of Allen Kahn equations. And if uh, you st you're still lucky and kind of this is a gradient uh, of a nice potential, um, then, uh, then uh, you would expect that you get a multi-phase mean curvature flow. Um, but there's not so much known. The only um, result at the moment is uh, a paper by myself and Teresa that we wrote in our, during our PhD. Um, and uh, there we prove that under, under an, uh, a certain assumption on, on the energy convergence, uh, you can prove that the limit is, uh, is a distributional solution. But this is again, uh, uh, kind of a different setting than, than what, what I'm presenting today, because today I don't want to make any of these assumptions. Okay. <clears throat> and then, yeah, there, there's lots of other things, but maybe I don't, don't talk about this. Um, so here's a little lemma that you can prove uh, that uh, that somehow just just uh, properties of these solutions. 
so that every every strong solution every classical solution is a weak solution and i mean all the things that you could ask yourself let me just point out one thing and that is that is really crucial is this continuity in time so this is what you have for bv solutions and so on but you i mean you don't have this for brachyflows and here you get it for free just from the inequality and it's pretty clear because you have this l2 integrability of the uh, of the velocity if the velocity makes any sense uh, then this uh, then l2 for the velocity should give you a Hölder type estimate for the volumes okay and and it's in fact true so that's a very simple statement to prove okay so let me um let me take a, just a few moments to to give you some of the ideas of the proofs um, so the, the, uh, the basic idea for this Alan Kahn to mean curvature flow uh, is kind of, uh, you, you would expect that you have equipartition of energy so that this estimate that I'm showing you here in the first line is sharp, that you do, uh, you do uh, just uh, um, Young's inequality and then you recognize this as the derivative of something. Uh, and that is a trick that is uh, so, uh, fundamental and so uh, so beautiful uh, it has been used uh, in the community over and over again and was first discovered by Monica and Motula and to my surprise uh, only a few years ago I, I learned that uh, Bogomolny also uh, independently uh, also wrote this down in a, this is in, in the Soviet Journal of uh, Nuclear Physics um, so probably this was not known to Monica and Motula and it's uh, you know it's a two column paper and it's uh, but it's a really uh, really needs uh, need to argument also here. So it's basically exactly this uh, um, this this inequality here. And uh, okay, so this is a well known uh, there's a well known fact, and um, and that kind of uh, gives you uh, because you have bounds on the energy gives you a bound on this BV norm of these functions of psi epsilon. Um, so that uh, kind of motivates to define the energy measures as these guys because we know they they are finite, right? And then um, the, the measures that were mentioned in the theorem are just exactly these measures with this, I have to equip them with some direction and they can just take the, the normal to the level set. And whenever this is uh, degenerate, I can just take uh, the first unit uh, vector or so. And so the key to the result is to find two, um, uh, two functions that are kind of, uh, that are measurable with respect to this, uh, with, with, respect, with respect to this measure. And this uh, is, an, I mean, we, we know this uh, very well for the mean curvature vector. This is already in Ilmanen's paper, but we didn't know this for the velocity. And, and that is maybe uh, um, one of the simple uh, uh, novelties of that paper is that you can write down this, uh, this velocity, approximate velocity, and it satisfies exactly everything that you would like to have. So this, this definition here, um, this guess uh, for the proxy of the normal velocity uh, really uh, plays an important role that you take. I mean, you could have taken just uh, um, kind of uh, maybe a rescaling just, just with the uh, powers of epsilon times dTu. And um, you could have taken, you could divide here by the gradient of u and so on. But exactly this term here works out perfectly. And, and here's the simple lemma that we get. I mean, we want to get uh, the sharp lower bound between the terms that we get in the energy dissipation inequalities. Uh, and we want the transport equation, right? And the point is uh, that this V epsilon satisfies uh, both of the crucial um, properties approximately, uh, and then you can pass to the limit. Okay, and the, um, uh, yeah, and the idea of proof is just you compute whatever this is and under suitable assumptions on the initial conditions, this will for all times be less or equal to one. This is a, this is a nice, uh, nice quantity that we can control. Okay, so um, I have maybe uh, um, one, one minute to, to finish up and I want to show, tell you a little bit about, the, about this weak strong uniqueness. So this, uh, we first did this with uh, Julian Fischer, um, Sebastian Hensel and Teresa Simon, but here I want to point out uh, maybe what are the differences uh, in our case here. Um, so there we don't, uh, we have kind of these sets of finite perimeter. So here we have these very false, but still uh, the relative uh, energy that you want to write down. So this is uh, in this business of relative entropy, relative energy. Um, you just uh, take the total energy and you subtract the linear functional. 
and uh, and that is the functional that we take. Um, and you want to prove some kind of uh, Gronwald type inequality. Um, okay, so that's, uh, and the xi and the theta, these two functions here, this vector field here should be an extension of the um, unit normal of, of your smooth solution. And this should be something like the side distance to your smooth solution. Uh, and uh, kind of, you have to construct them correctly uh, to, to, uh, to do this argument that, that I'm saying that you just need to prove these inequalities. Of course, this is a delicate, uh, a delicate argument. Um, but maybe let me tell you one last thing about this uh, relative energy. So if you just uh, uh, just write it down in, uh, uh, in a complicated fashion, so I, uh, this is the, the first term, the one uh, that I integrate there. And I, let me add and subtract um, just the total variation of, uh, of chi. Um, and then I use the compatibility. Um, and then you see here, the second term is just the tilt axis on the, on the regular part. And this is the, the kind of uh, the uh, discrepancy between uh, your very fold and the set of finite perimeter, the boundary of the set of finite perimeter that you have. And if you control the relative energy, you control, control each of these terms independently. And you control even other terms here. Um, the density and so on. Um, okay, so um, I'll, I'll stop here. Um, and so all of this you can find in this first paper, um, but I, I also give, give you some other references here that you might want to look up. Okay, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Tim, for this very nice talk. Um, so I think we could maybe use a few minutes for, for questions, maybe uh, overlap a little bit on the, on the break. Uh, is there a question? Yeah. Adriana? Uh, can I ask you a question? Uh, uh, I really enjoyed your talk, and uh, uh, I was not able to enter deeply in, uh, in uh, the novelty of your approach. I see that you use uh, oriented varifold instead mm -hmm. of unoriented. That, so, that's true. So that, uh, so that uh, you, you are keeping track of the orientation of the different uh, uh, pieces that you have uh, into folding phenomena. Mm -hmm. so, so, so my curiosity is uh, when you have uh, 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 the total variation of the function of the phase field function and uh, the, the, the limiting varifold and you try to compare the excess. So, so the, the bad time where in a sense you can drop down in, uh, in, the, in the mass of uh, your varifold. Uh, uh, can you say that uh, uh, the excess of the varifold with respect to the total variation is balanced with respect to the plane variable, the orientation variable? You, you see what I mean? Uh, uh, can, you, can you say that the difference uh, in a sense uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, respect the, the, the symmetry of the sphere, uh, uh, that every plane is present also with the opposite orientation. Mm -hmm. So you say, okay, if you have multiplicity two, let's say, to make it simpler, yeah, yeah, for instance, but then I would for have a superposition of two Dirac's in my, in my uh, very- Exactly, part. exactly. And that is, that is not, um, and that's true. I mean, so, uh, um, I mean, so, so the point is that uh, you see the screen still, right? The, the, the compatibility uh, sees this in the sense that this is zero, the expected value of the normal is zero. And, uh, and of course this is zero because you're not on the, uh, on the boundary of that, uh, of that set of finite parameter, right? Not on the essential, on the, um, essential boundary um, or reduced boundary. Um, and um, so, so you want to control now the points where you have multiplicity uh, two, let's say, by by, by what? By. Uh, uh, I, I don't. I don't see. Uh, 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 I mean uh, that uh, compatibility relation is a relation in average. Uh, uh, exactly. So where you have higher multiplicity, you will. This will be zero, and this will be zero. Both sides will be zero. Be, because I mean, you you have uh, maybe multiplicity too, but in average, you I mean, you have uh, half a Dirac uh, pointing to the left and half a Dirac pointing to the right. So so the, the, there's no information in here in some sense, right? 
Um, I, yeah. I maybe will move uh, would move the discussion on the breakout room because it's yeah okay, okay. <laughs> yeah yeah sure sure, sure. thank you thank you very much okay. yeah thank you me. we should we should just continue okay. so maybe and, and by the way we control we control both independently right the tilts and the and this is also controlling how far you're away from a Dirac um, as long as you have a strong solution there we control them independently but if you control one by the other I don't. No, right now, but we can discuss. Okay.